Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Around July 2000, I was made redundant from my job at a web design firm. Life wasn't supposed to unfold this way. I'd just moved to Auckland from Mumbai, India, and here I was, barely a few months later, without a job and a mortgage that hovered around $200,000. What do you do when you're in such a situation? I turned to Photoshop. Now, there's a story behind that Photoshop, and it began back in India. In Mumbai, I freelanced as a cartoonist, and work was pretty steady through the year, except around July. For some inexplicable reason, the phones would stop ringing at that point of the year. At first, it drove me crazy, and I'd do everything I could to drum up business. I would rant, I would rave, I would complain. And then one day my mother pointed out to me that things were always quiet for me in July. From that point on, we'd use July to learn how to use Photoshop. Now, one of the big games of the office, and yes, I had an office and I had staff, and one of the games was to learn how to use Photoshop without using the toolbars. So if you go to Photoshop and you press tab and you press F, you will find that suddenly the toolbar disappears and all you've got is a screen to deal with. And that's what we learned. We learned how to work Photoshop without the toolbars. A bystander would look in awe as you were able to use the brush tool, increase opacity, decrease the brush sizes, and you could do almost anything in Photoshop without needing the toolbar. It looked like pure magic. It was this magic I had to use when I was made redundant. The moment I was made redundant, I went back to trying to get work as a cartoonist. Since most cartoonists at the time were still using pen, ink, and paint, my work in Photoshop stood out. And so when I went to meet the art directors at the advertising agencies, they would start chatting because there was this digital Photoshop stuff happening. One particular art director got a bit chatty. And then we talked about how we could use the magic of Photoshop. And so while I started out trying to sell cartoons, I ended up charging $60 an hour teaching art directors how to use the core tools of Photoshop and this without using the toolbar. Now notice something very interesting in that last sentence. I wasn't teaching them Photoshop. I wasn't going into that rabbit hole of Photoshop, where they have all these tools and stuff which drives beginners crazy. Instead, I was just showing them a subset, the core tools of Photoshop without the need of a toolbar. And this is precisely the kind of advice I'd give a client if they ask me how to start a profitable business. I'd say you need to ask yourself three questions. They are who, what, and when. So that's what we're going to start off with. We're going to go through the three questions that help you build a profitable business in this episode of the three month vacation. Let's start out with the first question, which is who? I've been pretty good at drawing since a very young age. And like every other kid around me, I did the usual doodles, I scribbled. But then when all the other kids at four or five stopped doing all those doodles and scribbling, I continued. And so For the past 30, 40 years, that's what I've been doing. So you would think, hey, you must be very good at it, right? But drawing is a bit like cooking. Just because you're good at cooking Italian food doesn't mean you're going to be any good at Japanese. Over the years, I became exceptionally good at drawing cartoons. I love the structure of buildings. I love architecture. I even dabbled in caricature. But there's one thing I avoided, and that is drawing animals. I decided very early in my life that I was not too good at drawing animals. 
Then recently I got this bunch of envelopes and I didn't know what to do with them. They were very good quality and, and I gave away a lot of them, but I still have a lot. And so what I started doing was I took my fountain pen and I started drawing animals on the envelopes. And that led to a bit of a mission. I started drawing more and more animals and I posted these photos online. The moment I posted these photos online, there was a flurry of interest. People from different parts of the globe started giving me advice on what I should do with them. You should print them, said one. You should start a collector's item box set, said another. And so the advice kept pouring in and did exactly what advice usually does. It confuses you beyond belief. The reason why you're hearing this story is to give you a framework of how a profitable idea doesn't arise from an ability to do something. A profitable idea rises from the first question that you have to ask, which is who. So why is who so important? Without the who in mind, struggle is almost inevitable. Think about the boxed set of envelopes, for example. There is no doubt that they make a great product, but well intended as the suggestions were, there's no clue who would buy it or why they would buy it. Yet, if we took that earlier example, which is the Photoshop course, we notice there is an enormous amount of clarity. The clarity came from that art director. So who's going to buy it? The art director is going to buy it. And this is what we find with profitable ideas. They don't come from this strategy. They come from fluke. Someone says something and suddenly you go, oh yeah, I could do that. And you know who you're selling that idea to. When I started teaching that art director, it was a service. It wasn't a product, but it helped me generate an income for several months. And then after I was done with that art director, another art director asked me to teach his daughter. And so what we have is this idea that comes from pure fluke, but it has a very clear target in mind, a very clear who in mind. The who matters whether you're creating an article or creating a product or a service. Let's say you're creating an online product on storytelling. Now, before you start writing a word, you are aware of the volumes of story-related material that's out there in books, in videos, in audio. To write just another series on storytelling, that's nice, but how is it going to stand out? There's a lot of average stuff out there, and you know your stuff is going to be better, but still, uniqueness is relatively easy. So why would you want a Me Too product when you can have one that is clearly outstanding? See, when you create a product or a service for someone in particular, they give you their ideas, their own specific bent of mind in a way, their own problem that they're facing, and this creates a sustainable idea. This creates an amazing idea. Fluke plays an incredibly important role in this game of finding the who. We're so hell-bent on finding the right person, the right target profile, that we don't dare venture far from our computer screens. When I ran into that chatty art director, I had no clue that she'd talk about Photoshop. And this is the mistake that we make most of the time. We expect that we're going to run into the ideal person right away. And more often than not, the who is a complete fluke. At first, almost every good product or service is just version 1.0 of the product. And the feedback that you're going to get from that person is also going to be limited. So if you were going to create a product or a service, then you're going to go from version 1 to version 1.1 to 1.2 and so on. With every product or service that's profitable, there is going to be a version 1. And then you have to go around refining it. When you fix things, your product becomes better, it becomes more profitable, and there's always a who a who that will give you feedback. It will help you take that product to a completely different level. But even if there is a who in place, what you have to deal with is the what. And the what is what we deal in the second section. 
The what depends on a simple concept. It's the idea of a superpower. Think of the last workshop you attended, then think of the pile of notes that you walked out with. That is a good example of a lousy workshop. Workshops should give you, the client, a superpower. When you walk into the door, you obviously don't have that superpower. Yet, by the time you leave, you should be able to consistently use that superpower for your work, for your life. You shouldn't need the additional notes. You shouldn't need tons of follow-up information. The door, that should be your benchmark. If you leave that door without being proficient at a skill, it's not a workshop. It's just a disguised seminar overloaded with information that you'll never need or use. The same applies to the what of your product or service. When you call in a plumber to fix the leaky tap, you don't want information on how the plumbing system works. When you buy bread at the bakery, you don't want anything less than the freshest, crunchiest bread. You don't want all this information. And yet, when you're about to create a product or service, it's unlikely that you're thinking of superpowers. That bread, that plumber, they bring superpowers. They change your life. And they do it in a very simple way. There's nothing complex. There's nothing new about it. So the what of a product doesn't call for more. It calls for less. When people think of something that's profitable, they're benchmarking those crazy products that they see online. You know the kind because it's likely that you've shelled out your hard-earned money to buy something that's loaded with endless amounts of information and there's very little there that you can implement immediately it's all bottled up it's all fluffed up to look good and big and beautiful but when you think of that example of photoshop with the art director you'll notice that the art director went from not being able to use photoshop very fluently to being able to use photoshop without the toolbars so what you've got to do is you've got to define the endpoint What is happening at the endpoint? Let's take, for example, one of the psychotactics courses that we had recently. It was about storytelling. We had it in the US and Europe. The benchmark was that the client was able to find an outstanding story in seconds to polish the story and then reconnect it back to the article. So when you are creating a product or service, you need to benchmark what's going to happen. What are these two or three things that are going to happen? And usually you'll end up with 10,000 things. Now, the what demands that you drop 9,997 of those 10,000 things and consider just three at most. Why three? Because you can take a person through those three steps and they're able to go from one end to the other. As you can see, the what isn't about content. It's about structure. When you look at most of the products, most training, most workshops, you'll see that they need an underlying seam of structure. Even on courses that may involve a lot of stages, there is this structure behind it. And the structure is engineered to bring a superpower to the client rather than more information. An idea is profitable when it has the power to transform. We're all drowning in information. And when clients start at a basic level, they need to feel that superpower right away. They need to walk in uninformed. They need to walk out with this definite ability. The only way you can create a superpower is to offer less and to go deeper into that subject matter. Now, the depth depends on what you're offering, of course. There are no strict rules or guidelines. Now, the article writing course has several audios and it has maybe 200 pages of notes. The testimonials, which is seemingly a very small topic, has, I think, about 125 to 150 pages. And then you look at something like storytelling, and it has 59 pages. So there is no specific, okay, it needs to be these many pages, or it has to have so many videos, or that many audios. The goal is the superpower. If you're able to transform the superpower in three minutes, or three pages, or three audios, or three videos, that's enough. 
If you want to benchmark the what step, you have to step into the client's shoes. With any course, you have to say, what is that benchmark? So with the article writing course, we have a single benchmark and that is speed. You need to be able to write a very good article within two hours. And what is a very good article? It has all the elements of the article writing course. So there are several elements. There are about six or eight elements. And you need to have all those elements. You need to put all that stuff together. And then in two hours, you should be done. That's a benchmark. That's a superpower. And that's why people come back time after time. That's why the article writing course is full year after year after year. That's why most of the courses are full, because there is a superpower in place. So we looked at the who, we looked at who is trying to get that superpower. And then the second thing is the what. So this takes us to the third part of this podcast, which is the when factor. So why does when matter? Eighteen thirty eight, eighteen forty, eighteen forty five, eighteen forty nine, eighteen fifty three, and eighteen fifty nine. For over twenty years, Charles Darwin postponed the publishing of his theory. Then on twenty fourth November, eighteen fifty nine, Darwin published his theory on the origin of species. It was priced at fifteen shillings and one thousand two hundred and fifty copies were sold. But Darwin wasn't keen on the book being published while he was alive. In fact, he had instructed his wife to set aside 400 pounds and then promote it after he had passed away. But this guy, Alfred Russell Wallace, got in the way of those plans. Alfred Wallace was a naturalist and he spent several years in Singapore and Southeast Asia. And what he discovered was evolution by natural selection and he did it all by himself. So he wrote an essay in Indonesia, and then he sent it to Darwin in 1858. When Darwin saw the contents of the letter, he knew that the origin of species couldn't wait any longer. It needed to be published right away. Otherwise, all of those years would be useless, seemingly useless. It would be attributed to another man. We are similar to Darwin in many ways. Our work may seem insignificant when compared with the work of Darwin, But if your work changes a single person's day, it's significant. You know from your own experience how a single line in a book may have caused you to stop and then re-examine what you were doing. Or a random comment that may have changed the way you went about your life or business. Our work seems insignificant only because we know it so well. But for others, it can be a major moment in their lives, which is why you need to start now. As you've probably heard or read somewhere on the Psychotactics site, most of our work started very unpolished. At this very moment, Renuka is in the next room laughing at one of my articles. And I wrote this article several years ago. So it's so unpolished and so almost arrogant that she is laughing at it. So that's what happens. You start off with this very unpolished stuff. and. That applies to everything. If you've looked at the brain audit, the very early version of the brain audit, it was unpolished. If you looked at the article writing course, it was unpolished. You looked at all the stuff that sells so well today on psychotactics, it was unpolished. And if you think that your work is crappy, there is a good reason why. Because your work is crappy. The brain audit was crappy when we started out. All our courses, all our workshops, they were crappy. And it's done by choice. We did the best that we could, but now I can't even bear to go back and look at the early versions. So you too are going to need to bolster up your confidence. You need to get your work going through text, through audio or presentation, because if you don't do it, someone else will. Darwin had all the material he needed, but he was still reluctant to publish his work. And now there are several reasons why, and it's not all related to his work. But the point is that all of us feel this way. Here I am giving you this advice, and I'm reluctant as well. 
I've been working on a concept of talent since about 2008. And so many years have passed. And yes, I've written the odd article here or there, but there is no program, there's no book, there's no webinar, there's no podcast. So let me ask you this question. Would you like to read about how to become talented in just about any field? Would you like to read about what holds us back? It's not like I'm holding this material back, but again, you feel reluctant to publish your work because you think, well, it's not ready. But you, as a listener, as a reader, would this information be important to you? Your work is more important than ever. My work is more important than ever. It may appear raw to both of us, but we need to start now and fix it later. We're hoping for that one great idea, but we need to start with a little idea. Will the little idea fail? Yes, but you need to keep moving ahead. You need to keep fixing things. Even Darwin's work was just the start of his journey. When he published that stuff in 1859, it was just the start. It went through six editions. There were changes. There were revisions. Because counter-arguments pop up, and, and it popped up with Darwin as well. And he revised it. But he didn't just stop there. He, in 1871, he examined human evolution. He examined sexual selection in the descent of man. He went on to write so much stuff, the expression of emotions in man and animals. He did research on plants. He published a series of books. His final book was the formation of vegetable mold through the action of worms. Now, he looked at earthworms. He looked at their effect on soil. And when he died, he was honored by a burial in Westminster Abbey, where only royals and generals and admirals and big shots, that's where they get buried. And to think that Darwin almost didn't start on his journey. Do you still want to wait? Or are you going to start today? This brings us to the end of this podcast, so let's do a summary. We covered three things, the who, the what, and the when. When you start off with anything, you have to consider the who. Who is going to be interested in your product? And you can't do this by sitting at your computer. You have to go out there and you have to start speaking to people and you have to get started. You have to get started because your what, which is the next step, needs to be a superpower. People need to feel that they can go from one point to the other and they're going to tell you how you should do your job. So that what is going to come in by fluke, by a random conversation, and it's not going to happen when you're sitting at your desk. And when? You have to start now. And your work is going to be crappy. It should be crappy because that's how work starts. It always starts out crappy. You have to start out now. The biggest problem that you have isn't that you need this great idea for business. You just need to start. But there is something holding you back. Just understand that there isn't going to be a moment when you will get a great idea. The brain audit wasn't a great idea. It was just a presentation. And the reason why psychotactics exist is because we just went through with it. We got pushed into it. We got pushed into it online and offline, but we got pushed into it. So you need to start now. Identify who you think will buy the idea. Then work on the what that you're going to sell. Make it a superpower and start now. If you keep at it, the rest will change along the way. The road will change, it'll morph, it'll change. That's how it works. Teaching Photoshop wasn't a new idea. It wasn't even a great idea. And that's the whole point. What you're looking at is how do I get a client from A to B? And who's that client? And yes, I know I'm repeating myself, but this is the point. You have to get started. If you don't get started, nothing happens. And that's what you need to do today. Get started. That's the one thing that you can do today. Get started. Get out of there. Go and meet a client. Go and meet some people. Start working on that superpower. So what's happening in Psychotactics land? The first thing that's happening is the Psychotactics cartooning course. Now, we started this as a crappy idea, a really crappy idea. In fact, the early cartooning courses were just 
built as we went along. The assignments were built as we went along. It has a lot more polish today. And you will find that you can become a cartoonist. Improbable as that sounds, you can become a cartoonist. And there is the Da Vinci course. It's starting on the 22nd of August. And it goes all the way to March of 2017. And you learn to become a cartoonist at a very unhurried pace. So that's psychotactics.com slash Da Vinci. There's also the headline course. Now, people tell you, oh, you can just copy headlines. Oh, you can just do this with headlines and do that with headlines. You have to test headlines. No, you don't. You can write amazing headlines, not just one, two, 15, 20, but hundreds of headlines back to back. And this headline course starts on the 6th of September. You have to be on the psychotactics list to get the notification. We have very limited seats. And unlike other people, we don't say we have 20 seats and then give it to 21 people. When we say we have 20 seats, we give it to 20 people. Now, if you're a member of 5000 BC, you get first preference. Of course, you should. But the other thing about being a member of 5000 BC is that it's the kindest place on the internet. It's the place where you get help, where people help you, where I am there all the time, unlike other places where you sign up to this membership and then you never see the person ever again. I'm there all the time, so check it out. There is a waiting list. You have to wait for 21 days, so you need to get to 5000 BC sooner than later because you still have to wait. You can't just pay and get in. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now, and I'll see you in 5000 BC.